Slow Burn Media and Bill Huffman present this week's episode of My Passion Case with the one and only, The Captain from True Crime Garage. The abduction of Madeline McCann, the daughter of our friends Kate and Jerry, on May the 3rd, 2007, changed all our lives in an instant, but for no one more so than Madeline. The defamatory stories written about us were not only extremely damaging, on a personal level, but we strongly feel were detrimental to the search for Madeline. For a long time, Scotland Yard suspected Madeline was abducted from the family's rented holiday apartment during a burglary. Did you, as a mother, Kate, just sometimes think, I've got to go and be out there with them, I want to go and just physically look as well? I mean, I did. Um, I mean, we've been working really hard, really, at apartment. The first 48 hours, as Jerry says, were incredibly difficult, and we were almost non-functioning, I'd say. If the Metropolitan Police decides to close their investigation, that doesn't mean that we are going to close our. Our two investigations are not dependent one on each other. Well, late last year, we were informed that there may be some hacking or attempts at hacking around our numbers, my, Kate and Jerry's numbers, people associated with them who've been helping them. Somebody's doing a burglary, panicked maybe by, by a waking child, and that's sort of what leads to Madeline going missing. Scotland Yard was brought in six years ago after the failed first Portuguese investigation. One of their suspects was José Carlos da Silva, a former driver at the holiday complex. It, it is one year since Madeline was taken, and... To some extent, I speak on behalf of the family in that we're here to thank the people of Luge, the people of Portugal, who have supported our, our family, Jerry and Kate, all of us and our friends in our time of turmoil, of pain. We believe that Madeline is still alive and can be found. We ask anyone who has any information, however small or seemingly unimportant, Please come forward. Scotland Yard was brought in six years ago after the failed first Portuguese investigation. We have actually, in our own way, it might not be physically searching, but we've been working really hard and doing absolutely everything we can really to get Madeline back. Our only aim is to see her safely recovered and reunited with the family who so adore her. Hello and welcome to episode five of My Passion Case. Again, I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this week's guest is the captain from True Crime Garage. And this week we will be discussing one of the most famous cases in all of the world, and we'll just jump right into our conversation. So here we go. This week's guest is the one and only the captain, who is co-host of one of True Crime's best shows, in my opinion, and one of the top rated shows in all of iTunes. And that is the captain. So welcome to my passion case. And thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, finally you talk to the, the real hero of the true crime garage duo, the captain. You're always talking to Nick. This is true. I do talk to Nick a lot. So this is an extra special episode where I get to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about a certain case that got you interested in the whole genre to begin with. And what case did you pick to discuss this week? Well, this one, this was difficult to think about because also as I know that you're talking to Nick. So I started thinking that maybe Nick was going to talk about West Memphis three, not for sure if he was going to pick that case, but that, that was probably the first case to really get me other than like just reading about serial killers in general, the West Memphis three case really got my head turning where I, I wanted to see different you know, parts of evidence. And, and there's so many cases, like when you said, what's your passion case? I'm like, okay, well, there's West Memphis three, there's Adnan Syed, there's John Benet Ramsey. So the, the OJ Simpson case, for example, is, is, is another one. And then if you go into the missing person realm, I've been looking in um, more privately as far as like working with private investigators on the disappearance of Brian Schaefer from Columbus, Ohio. And because he disappeared in my hometown, I've actually been able to do some groundwork and then always been fascinated with the case of uh, Mara Murray. But that being said, 
I the uh, case that I keep going back to is the Madeline McCann case. Uh, she went missing May 3rd of 2007, and her family was on vacation. And this case has always really got me because it has, I think, all the ingredients. One, we have a situation with, with a family being on vacation in a place that they're not well known. There's multiple eyewitness accounts. There's multiple stories. And it was such a big case. It, it, it blew up so big. There's been several documentaries on it. And I think those are the cases that are easier, I think, to get wrapped up in because there is so much information. Yeah, I definitely would think that all those cases that you mentioned in the beginning, especially the West Memphis West Memphis 3, was it the uh, documentaries that got you into the, that case, uh, the HBO I, documentaries, or was it? It was actually a, a friend of mine was reading a book about it. Uh, was it The Devil's Knot? I think so, or I think he had something that said Paradise Lost, and it had the three faces of the three that were accused. And I just remember seeing this this book. And, and plus, my father being a detective, it was always kind of in the back of your head. I mean, as far as crimes go. And it was also weird growing up because like most of my friends' parents, I didn't know what they did. And everybody knew my dad was a, a police officer or a detective. But I think that one really hit me because I think with the West Memphis Three, especially I think for for boys, is we can identify as those eight-year-old little boys meeting up and riding bikes together in the neighborhood with our friends. If anybody went through a little rebellious phase as a teenager, we could relate to the accused. It's so relatable. Both sides are relatable in the sense that you're kind of railroading the kids, the older kids, and then the kids that got killed, they kind of become the backstory. And I always kind of think of that case like I think of the Jacob Wetterling case as yeah. one of like my passion cases because that also is like one of those just, I mean, 11 years old, abducted riding his bike by some stranger on the side of the road. So, I mean, it's, I think that we do kind of. Well, and you, and you grew up in that time period. So to be 11 years old, your bike was your main source of, main source of getting around town. And it's very common to, for me anyways, to be way across on the other side of town, on the other side of the railroad track, on my bicycle, possibly with nobody, just riding to my friend's house. Uh, so so when you hear a story like the, the Wetterling case, you go, I can identify with that. I know that, I mean, I rode my bike and we snuck out. We did all sorts of thing, dumb things when we were 10, 11 years old. That We could have easily been one of those victims or, you know, random stranger abductors, abductions. And I just think that we kind of all gravitate towards the cases that relate to us the most. And, and I think with the McCann case, I mean, personally, I've always felt that there's so many questions left unanswered. And that, go, that start from the beginning. And where do you, where do you fall in the, uh, with the whole case as far as who you think? Well, I guess let's just talk about who you think did it. No, I'm not going to ask you that. I'm way. not going to add. Yeah, let's just cut all the bull. Tell me who you think it is. No, I want to know what happened. And your opinions on how it could have gone down and let's go from there. Well, let's just do a simple version of this. Sure. This, yeah. Because everybody knows the case a little bit. So the simple form is here's a family. They're on vacation. They're on vacation with multiple people, a, a bunch of friends, and they go to Portugal. And it's kind of a cheaper area. And a lot of people question that because um, they had money. And so they think that this was kind of a slumming it. Uh, you hear often, personally, from seeing the pictures, diagrams, and the research I've done on the place that they stayed, it was pretty nice. And I think anybody traveling there would have been like, this is pretty nice, pretty nice resort. Now, it's all, we. what's interesting about this case is we have these people hanging out, going to dinner pretty much every night and leaving their kids back in their rooms and then checking on them periodically. During one of the nights, they go to check on the kids and Madeline is gone. And that's the simple form of it. And But what's interesting to me though, is this case has a lot of interesting factors. One, we have a diagram of the resort. We have a diagram of where the parents were. We have the parents making a very, uh, some would say a suspicious act in the fact of like, Maybe not suspicious might, might might not be the right word, but just 
most people would go, wait, so you left your kids in your hotel room and you went to eat? Like, questionable. Yeah, it's very questionable, you know, action for parents. But it's very questionable action for multiple parents. It wasn't like they were the only ones doing it. And then they, in this case, also had some interesting nicknames because the restaurant that they were eating at was the Tapas Restaurant. So they become known as the Tapas Seven. Mm-hmm. And um, again, we now we have seven accounts from the the people a part of the Tapas Seven. And the if you take all seven accounts, they don't line up. So that again, so again, that's something that people think is fishy. And but that's also something that you could rule as well. That's seven eyewitnesses their stories aren't going to line up because most of the time eyewitness accounts are not 100% accurate. Yeah, they're the least reliable. Right. Like I said, there's so many documentaries on this and there's so many, you know, 60 Minutes and, and Dateline and all these people that have looked into the case and you could just go over on a surface level. And on top of that, you have, like I said, you have these parents that are from a different country. So now... Not only is there local law enforcement involved, but there's other law enforcement involved as well. So it it, it just becomes a big cluster real quick. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you have seven people trying to give you seven different accounts, I think that turns into a cluster <laughs> instantly. Yeah. And I think the fact that people think that um, Kate and Jerry were the parents' names, I think the fact that Kate and Jerry made um, a bad decision Again, I don't think people would look at it as that bad of a decision to eat about a football field away from your kid's room. I don't think they'd look at it as that bad of a decision, obviously, if the kid didn't go missing. But since the kid went missing, it was like, oh, well, see, they're the worst parents in the world. And that's where the suspicion starts. Then it turns from, you know, this weird thing where they go, well, did did they take her? Did somebody take her? Or did she die? And I think that is a pretty big leap, but I feel like I'm all over the place right now. No, you're not. You're, you're, I mean, the way you're laying it out is basically the way I interpret what you're saying is, okay, the family makes a bad decision. Multiple families make the bad decision of going to dinner and leaving their children yeah. back at the condos. Now, granted, we're talking, they weren't far away. It's not like they went on the other side of the resort. They were, you know, from what I've read, they're only 150 feet or so away from the rooms. Yeah. And again, it's weird though, too, because if you look at the pictures from the restaurant to like the front door of the room they're staying in, mm-hmm. like to me, when I see certain pictures, I go, well, yes, there's a pool between me, you know, but I can see the door. If I can see the door, that's not that big of a deal. How many times have you been at your friend's house? You know, one of, one of my buddies, I go over and I'll have a, a beer with him and we sit down by his fire pit and his fire pit is 50 yards from the house and his kids are inside sleeping, but he can see the house. He can see the door. You know, I don't ever think when we're having a beer and hanging out and catching up, wow, my friend's an awful parent. You know what I mean? Like, right. We should be inside. And I and I get that it's not your house. And I get that it's a foreign country. I get that. But uh, I think we they, they put a lot of weight on that. And they they use people use that as as a way to I think turn the crime into something that I don't know if it is. We also have not only do we have eyewitness accounts, seven of them, but we also have a timeline that was basically given by the parents and other people on the vacation. This is what we did on Monday. This is what we did on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And because this case has been gone over with a fine tooth comb a million times, you get discrepancies in that. Well, if you ask me what I did last Friday, I don't know. You know? Yeah. I I mean, I I couldn't tell you. I mean, I, I, I know I went to Chipotle. I know I went to bed early. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like if somebody said to me, what time I go, I don't know. 12 31 and then if you came back later and said that well, was two maybe it was you see what i'm saying mm-hmm. so I think there's a lot of times when 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 they start dissecting the timeline of the week then it becomes well the parents are lying and the tap is seven are lying and again but we also have eyewitness accounts in this we have eyewitnesses that saw a man carrying a child the so tanner sighting yeah yeah the tanner sighting um, then you have the Smith sighting 
And so, so yeah, it's just, but the, I think the issue with the case, this case, like a OJ Simpson, this, this case has tons of information uh, that you kind of have to sift through. But the reason why I picked this case to talk to you about today was because there was, you know, when you, I think with your passion cases, and tell me if you do this, it'll be like 11 o'clock at night, not that tired. Mm -hmm. Nothing's on TV. My computer's just kind of staring at me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Uh, let's just go over and Google real quick. Right. And maybe it's John Benet Ramsey. Maybe it's West Memphis 3. uh, But normally there'll be something that's bothering me. And in this case, for whatever reason, I saw this pretty long YouTube interview and they started talking about this guy named Clement Freud, Mm -hmm. which was like the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And it was just kind of strange. So after their daughter goes missing, there's this guy, I believe he's in like, as far as like the government goes, like, like in England, right. Or something like that. But he has a place in Portugal that is not that far away. Mm Mm-hmm. So they they befriend this guy, and it's in her book. And the interview that I was watching was breaking down information. Basically, it was somebody that was breaking down information that, that Kate was talking about in her book and, and how he thought it was suspicious. Well, they end up becoming friends with this guy, Clement Freud, and he later dies. And after he's dead, I believe it's all, I think all the accusations against him are after he died, but there was pretty s- substantial evidence that this guy was a pedophile. So it's very strange that you have this attractive couple. They're attractive. Well, I don't know if attractive would be the right word, but their pretty young daughter goes missing. They are then befriended by somebody from their country that ends up being a pedophile. Yeah, right? I, I find that very too coincidental. Yeah, I feel. I, yeah. So, so then you have to then look up this individual to me when he reached out for help, this Clement guy, when he reaches out to the parents to say, Hey, look, I'm, I'm of power, right? Mm -hmm. I'm of power over there, but I live here too. So I know people here. I know law enforcement here. I can help you. Right. Mm -hmm. He like invited them in, cooked for them. Later on, like I said, these accusations and these charges, and it seems like all the evidence points to that this guy was a sicko pedophile. To me, that's him inserting himself into the case. I don't know if he got off on this. I don't know if he's actually responsible for this. Very strange looking guy. But where it gets more interesting to me is when you look at um, the, I think it's the, the Smith sighting, they do like a computer generated sketch. Right. And and a lot of people uh, think that looks like the Podesto brothers. Now, who the hell are the Podesto brothers? Well, there was this pizza gate quote unquote scandal or whatever you want to call it. Conspiracy. And a lot of people thought that John Podesto was involved in this basically child sex ring. So, those are those rumors. A lot of people think that conspiracy is bunk and there's no weight to it and there's no validity to the story. Okay, fine. But because of that, when you take the Smith sighting sketches, computer generated sketches, and you compare what the Podesto brothers look like, it's a pretty identical match. It's Can pretty close. Put- I've got I'm looking at it right now. And <laughs> anybody that doesn't even know much about the Madeline case, if you compare those two pictures, most people will go, that ah, looks like a match to me. Yeah, that's so weird. So when you see that, you go, okay, well, but again, let's not be stupid. Yes, the, the, the people match, but where do the Podestos live? They don't live in Portugal. See what I mean? So, right. so let's not take a, a, a giant leap. We, we have to get there somewhere. So, so when I found out that this guy of power with connections, Clement Freud was connected with the McCann case and you start wondering why, but then what I wanted to know was because since he was of some connection as far as government goes and forgive me, I don't have all the notes on him 
in front yeah, of he him. was an XMP. I mean, he was a, uh, you know, he worked for, from what I'm looking at, if we're talking about, I can't believe they still refer to him, but uh, late broadcaster, humorous politician, and chef Sir Clement Freed, Freed or Fro- Freud. Freud. Yeah. Connected so. to the, <clears throat> like I said, the famous Sigmund Freud. But yeah, so so he's connected to to government. Well, what what's interesting? He's he's actually connected to the Podesto brothers, and the Podesto brothers were actually reportedly known to stay at this guy's house. This guy's house, I believe, is like within like two miles from the resort this girl went missing from. So <laughs> you go. We got this sketch that was made by eyewitnesses. Uh, the, the Smith saw a man around 2,200 hours and uh, about 500 yards from the apartment which the family was staying in. And they were walking away from the Ocean Club and walking towards the beach, carrying a, a girl aged three to four. She had blonde hair and pale skin and where it was wearing light-colored p- pajamas. These are the the sightings that were made that night. Right. The sketches were made, like I said, looked like the Podesto brothers, but why would they be there? Right. Well, once you could connect the dots that they were friends with Freud, now a known pedophile, and I'm not saying that they are pedophiles. I'm just saying, is it possible that a sicko pedophile would be friends with other pedophiles? Is that a possibility? Yes. Is it a possibility they were friends with somebody and didn't know he was a pedophile? Possible. But what we do know is that guy's a known pedophile and what it is known or what the evidence seems to be able to appear is that these guys actually stayed at at Freud's house uh, several times and possibly stayed there during the week that this girl went missing. So I'm not saying that's a slam dunk. There's your answer. But uh, I find that so so that's kind of what happens with me as far as these passion cases is I'll go down a rabbit hole and I have to connect the dots until it at least leads to a dead end. And so that's kind of my dead end on this case is I go, okay, well, the, the sketch matches these two guys that are possibly connected to this very controversial conspiracy theory that most people think is complete nonsense. But they possibly were sighted that day carrying a child that matched the descriptions of the girl that went missing. Pretty strange to me. Yeah, this guy is a, this is an interesting, uh, interesting theory for sure. Yeah, and now this guy is also, um, I believe there's a guy named uh, Robert Marat, and he becomes a big suspect. Well, he's also connected to uh, Freud as well. Uh, look, we get tons of emails from people that don't believe that there's sex trafficking rings. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> and it's <clears throat> and it's crazy to me when I've talked with law enforcement that have worked those cases for a long time. And there's pedophile rings. And this we know just through child pornography rings. These sickos have a network and they share this information with each other. And so... I, I don't know. Is it is it possible that one of these individuals saw this girl? Or is it possible that they tell other criminals what they're looking for and then they kidnap individuals? If you look at the Johnny Gosh case, you know, a kid comes forward and says, Hey, by the way, I, I was I helped to abduct Johnny Gosh. And the guy that abducted it with with me, he wasn't an abuser, he wasn't a pedophile but he would collect children for these rings and they would pay him a bunch of money. So is it possible that, I mean, we have a known pedophile in the area? Is it possible? I mean, this is how sick it could be. This Clement Freud, he could have abducted her or paid somebody to abduct her. He could have took her back to his place. He could have tortured her, tortured her. He could have raped her. He could have murdered her. He could have buried her. They could throw her out in the ocean. We don't know. I mean, when you're minutes away from a helicopter ride to dump somebody in the middle of the ocean, or they're never going to be seen again, especially a little body like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm just painting a picture of what possibly could happen. 
And then this sicko decides after this that he's going to befriend the family and befriend the mother and father. Uh, look, I'm not putting anything past somebody that has fantasies of torturing a, a child sex, sexually. So, like I said, I mean, there, there's tons of information on this case. It's actually it's actually a bad case to talk about because there is so much information. But like I said, <clears throat> I like to find a rabbit hole. And when I was watching this interview, they they brought up um, Freud. But at the time, it was he was a good guy. At the time, he was known to be a, a, this great guy and of power, and that they befriended him, and they ate dinner with him, and he helped them with the local law enforcement. He helped them with other things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That that was the the context. Well, now you know, handful of years later, the guy dies, and he was you know accused of rapes and, and child molestation and all other kinds of things. Did that come out before? Did that inform was that information that he was a pedophile come out after he died? I think there was. I think there was some rumor. I think whatever uh, case that they were building against him was brewing before he died. But I think it like the main stuff came out after he he passed away. And because that's that's the tough thing is like when like I said when you start down this rabbit hole and you go okay I'm looking at the case again, looking for new information. I've gone through the the tap is seven their accounts and how they don't line up and there's i mean there's a documentaries that i've watched where it's just an hour of them talking about the inconsistencies of these accounts again y- yes i understand on one level you go that the accounts don't line up so therefore these people are uh lying and therefore there's a reason for them to lie so they probably murdered this girl I understand people that see that. To me, I start off with the idea that there's seven eyewitnesses. Their accounts don't completely line up. You know, some people go, well, they said that they went to play tennis at 10, but we know it was 9 a.m. Those lying pieces of shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, maybe they just got it wrong. You know, let's just start off with the idea that they're not trying to con us. So, but I mean, there you can go over the statements of the Tapas Seven. You can go over that for months if you want. And I, but I don't think that gets you any closer. And I, so it's constantly when I'm sitting down with one of the passion cases, I sit down and kind of look at it as a whole and then just go, you know, where, what rabbit hole can I go down? And this one, like I said, it was just this weird thing where it was uh, Kate talking and she just brought up, you know, Freud. And I thought, oh, that's so strange and that he's related to Sigmund Freud. And I just thought that was strange. And then I was like, well, who's this guy? (laughs) You know, and so started going down that rabbit hole. But then once you can somewhat connect him to the Podesto brothers, it really, really freaked me out. Yeah, that's a little, uh, a little too coincidental. One, you, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say much about Pizzagate because no because a lot conspiracy yeah well but also I think this oh look I think this this angle of um, the Madeline case I think this sounds conspiracy but we like I said we do have this eyewitness that saw these two gentlemen one carrying a, a girl towards the ocean is it possible that the Podesto brothers were staying at Freud's house at the time that the girl went missing. It seems from the evidence that I've been able to uncover that that's a possibility. We know for a fact that they stayed in his house. So we do know that because uh, he's kept records of that. I believe somebody has records to prove that. The Podesta and, brothers? Yeah. So the Podesta brothers have stayed in Portugal. That's the other thing, too. Just start off with whatever idea. I mean, if there's a murder that took place in, in Germany, for example, kid gets murdered and the and the sketch comes out and it looks exactly like me the captain well you gotta start off with just first has has he ever been to germany right i mean so when you look at the podesta brothers and you you act not only find out that yes they've been to portugal but they've been to this guy's house that is like i said not that far away uh you know blocks away from this resort Um, that starts making this weird to me, what it sounds like is if I told you all this stuff, you go, wow, that sounds strange. 
But once <laughs> once you can prove it, then you go, well, then the the sh- the shoe seems to fit a little bit better. So, but it, yeah, that's what I've been trying to do with some of these cases. And I think with a lot of these big cases, I mean, cause we're, we're covering a case every week, but what's so funny about, I think some of these big cases is there's so many small details that are like miss. And, and so like when you're talking to the true crime, like fan base, if that makes any sense, the true crime fan base, when you're talking about these big cases, there's so many things that I think, you know, like people miss or choose to miss. So it's like, for example, there's fingerprints and handprints on the back of Ron Goldman that don't match OJ. Bloody fingerprints and handprints that look like somebody came up behind him, squeezed his shirt, turned it in. You know how like you would like squeeze a guy's shirt and put him against the wall? That's what it looked like somebody did to the back of Ron Goldman's shirt. And the fingerprints don't match OJ. So here's this giant, huge case with a mountain of evidence against OJ. The popular opinion is he he murdered her. That's, you know, I believe that on some level. But we also have evidence that there was somebody else there. We also have OJ writing a book stating, I was there with a guy named Charlie. Now, I think he says Charlie is a fake name in the book. But all <laughs> uh, OJ said that? Yeah, in his book, If I Killed Her. Yeah, the whole story is that Charlie shows up and Charlie's like, yeah, Nicole's doing this, Nicole's doing that. So he goes to Nicole's house and he, uh, Charlie gives him a knife and then he gets pissed off at Nicole and he blacks out, wakes up, Ron Goldman and Nicole are dead. And uh, he looks over at Charlie and says, what happened? And Charlie says, you killed him. Now, a lot of people think this is just made up, but I, I actually think it's probably the actual story because uh, I think OJ is suffering from you know ETC. And most of the time when there's a, a violent attack with somebody that is suffering from ETC, they, they do black out. Uh, they actually had a retired football player that killed his mother and doesn't remember it at all. But all the evidence, fingerprints, DNA, all that stuff proves that he did it. So... I think that's probably the, the truth. But like my point being, or like with the John Benet Ramsey case, a, you hear a lot of times that, that, that the parents didn't take polygraph test. And that's not true. They took three. I think they took three apiece. So that's what I've been working on. You know. Yeah. And, you know, in, in those cases too, like, I mean, what was it? John Mark Carr or whatever the hell the guy's name was from Portugal or, no, and that's not Portugal. It was like, thailand or something that said he was the killer of yeah, yeah. john bonnet yeah and it's like why didn't anybody do their due diligence on investigating whether this guy actually had done it before they went and ran to the press with it yeah well I, it's ridiculous so my father being a detective um sometimes there there's like a community of detectives that they'll share cases with so you might have this case and they share it with 20 detectives throughout the country to just mm-hmm. see if, if they can look at something and, and just, you know, maybe they write back, Hey, I would ask a question to this guy or look into the boyfriend more or whatever. And um, so I haven't talked about major cases, you know, that, that are popular in the true crime world. People think that a detective knows everything about the actual true crime world, the entertainment side. They know nothing. You know, if you ask a normal detective, you know, what do you think happened to Mara Murray? They're going to go, who? <laughs> and they haven't heard of the case and they normally don't care. Not that they don't care, but they don't have time to care. But one of the cases that my father's always been fascinated in was John Bonet Ramsey. He believes that it's basically what CBS said is that they think that uh, Burke accidentally hit her that caused her to die and that the parents covered it up. And what has not, I don't think been reported often is that John Benet, supposedly John Benet Ramsey's parents called their lawyer before they called 911. So my father claims that that information came from a detective that worked closely to the case. And this guy would not lie. Right. Mm -hmm. For years. So my father's idea is that, 
They realized that their son killed their daughter. They called their lawyer, said, our son accidentally killed our daughter. What do we do, right? We don't want him to go to jail. We want to protect him. That's what he believed happens. I think it's as likely or logical to think that this family, this rich family, gets a, a, a note, ransom note. They can't find their daughter. And it says, do not call the, don't, do not contact the police or we'll kill her. Is it possible that a parent, that parents would get a note like that, be scared to death to call police and then call their lawyers and say, what do we do? What would you do if you were me? And maybe their lawyer is also just somebody that they trust the opinion of. And the guy says, just hang up the phone and call 911. You have to, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think that's equally as as logical. So that's all, that's all I've been trying to do, and and I think um, because you know, like we hung out at Crime Con, these these events um, that we go speak at and hang out at. I mean, it's like you spend hours talking about these big cases. You know, Madeline McCann, Adnan Syed, West Memphis Three. John Benet Ramsey, Amara Murray, Brian Amy. Schaefer, Amy Mahalovic. I mean, you'll just spend hours, but you're only getting to talk about sections of the case. So through all that conversation I've had with that arm, look, anybody that tells me that they're big into true crime, I know that they're also an armchair detective. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I love that. I think it's awesome. I think that, you know, I don't want to sound, I don't want it to sound cruel but i think it's one of the most interesting things uh, uh, about this genre is you're an active participant if you want to be anybody could look up these cases and dive into different uh, facets of them and and with the you know with the madeline case there's i mean just some some of the stuff is so strange like they think that's i mean there's new reports that they they can't even prove when she, that she disappeared the day she disappeared on. Some people are saying that some of the photos are fake or some of the photos were altered. I mean, there's so much information, like I said, to dive through. Um, but I keep going back to this Smith sighting and seeing these two men that look like these high officials. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense, you know. Yeah, you, you know, I think if you stare at something so long, you know, long enough, I think anything will begin to look like you want it to look. But um, yeah, but I mean, this passes the eye test. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not gonna totally jump into um, the conspiracy theory on that side of things, but I could definitely see that there's resemblances between some of these pictures and. What is your feeling about the fact that the hotel itself, I mean, I was looking at the pictures of the map of the hotel and how far away they were. It also shows that they're like right up against the street, like the the way that their apartment lines up. Yeah. So it's kind of the way the resort works out is that Mm -hmm. the front would hit a main road uh, of the city and then the back would be hitting the resort. And so that part would be fenced in. Oh, okay. So the thing, the thing that always got me about this was uh, there was actually an apartment above them, and that was broken into a week earlier. And there was a, multiple break-ins. This resort was having issues with break-ins. And and, and is this resort this only these two buildings? Uh, I mean, I'm just I'm looking at it like I think it's a little bit. I mean, it just pre-air there. Dummy. Yeah, I'm just looking at the you know the pictures online, and it's you know it's got it's not, two main buildings and a pool. It doesn't look huge or anything like that. But I think they're connected to some uh, like there's some tennis courts and stuff. Yeah, I see that as well. Yeah, it's not a huge resort, but again, like I said, when you have when you're having an issue with break-ins, uh huh, and this is again, this is also never because <laughs> right when you hear. They're having issues with break-ins. You go, well, here's another irresponsible thing that the parents are doing. Let's go to the resort with the shitty break- with shitty break-ins. 
How the hell are the parents supposed to know that? The the parents were not told uh, uh, about these break-ins. And when, you know, like I said, a week before you have a break-in on the apartment above you, it's not that far-fetched. Again, now, again, you have to understand if these criminals break in and, and I steal some money or I steal some belongings from this foreign couple and I can sell that somewhere that's of value. There's also people that will go, yes, doesn't mean that you break in that you're a pedophile, but that doesn't mean that you don't know a, a network of people. And so that's the other possibility. And I think that becomes a, a simpler act. But as far as like a guy going in and going, well, I can take this girl. And they had been there for a number of days already. So it's easy for them to have been spotted by somebody who found interest in Madeline. Right. And but right. And what I'm saying is if if these guys, again, it, it doesn't have to be a pedophile that broke in and took her and then took her to somebody else. Somebody could have been paid is what you're saying to have committed that act and then passed that child on to potentially yeah. what trafficking basically involves right because there's a lot of countries there like if you go to parts of mexico there there's people kidnapping people they're not they're not the ones torturing the person they're not the ones selling the people they're not the ones trying to control the people they're just kidnapping them and getting them into the channels and they get paid for that and we know that exists so is it possible that that and and we also know stuff like that exists in portugal so Okay. Well, we know it exists in the whole all around the world. I mean, it, well, I know that, but some people that email the show, they, they don't believe anything. But, well, but what I'm saying is what we do know is there are reports of that in Portugal. What we do know is that there were reports of break ins in this facility. They did not let their their consumer, their consumers, their clients, uh, their residents of the, the resort. They did not let them know about this because, of course, they don't want them to cancel anything did they up security no did they do anything else no and i think like because they were there i think they eventually changed like the windows and put like bars and stuff on the windows but so it's like it, is this that simple because i think sometimes with these cases uh it starts going okay well did the parents kill um their kid and cover it up then there's these rumors that the, the parents were into like all this kinky stuff and you know then they killed their their daughter to cover that up there's rumors that they they killed their daughter with uh, pharmaceuticals there was rumors that the tapas seven were into sex and orgies and and pedophiles and and that's why they killed her i mean we're going from zero to a hundred real quick yeah pick your poison on that one and I think some of these, like, you have to think logical. Again, we have reports that the place is being broken into. The only people that are staying here, they're not locals. They're, they're people that are traveling. So these are people that are targeting people that are traveling to take goods so they get can get money. It's not that hard to think um, that there's also individuals that if there was an opportunity to take a child, that they could get paid for that. And we know that happens, like you said, all over the world, but we also know that it's definitely happening in Portugal. So to me, it'd be a lot hard. You know, here's a, I think sometimes when the case has too much information, it becomes almost impossible to so- solve, especially as an armchair detective, because you have to, it takes you months to sift through the information. You know There's I mean? so many different rabbit holes in this case. Especially with, um, as far as what you were mentioning before about pedophile rings or child pornography rings, I mean, that is a worldwide issue. That's not an issue that's just in America or in Portugal or whatever. So she could have been put into a system and, I mean, she is most likely not alive anymore. But at this point in time, you know, who's to say that she didn't spend some time in that scene, unfortunately? Yeah. And again, then sometimes with with one little, you know, the parents have admit have admitted over and over that it was a mistake. 
they shouldn't have ate that far away from their their apartment for the resort. They've admitted over and over that was a mistake. They keep going over the fact that we had people go in and look and and see our children, check on the children over and over. We made a mistake. But that one mistake then turns into other theories like that it was a planned abduction, that it was a planned burger, burglary, that because they made this one mistake, maybe they sold their child into sex trafficking. And I don't know. Like I said, I think some of those leaps are, are zero to 100. Right. And, and that... That's why these cases are your passion cases because they don't provide immediate answers. And well, I think I, here's why I think they're passion cases is like with the West Memphis three. Yes, I, I feel bad for the West Memphis three for being accused of something that they probably didn't do. And then the state lets them out. And we, and we, there's four or five documentaries. And what is the focus? Focus is interrogations. So on the West Memphis three case, they focus in on the this interrogation. They focus on a confession that's probably wrong. Where's the focus on the three victims? Where's the focus on those three little boys? Right. In this case, for example, we're going to focus on the parents. We're going to focus on the investigators. We're going to focus on the seven people with them, the ta- or the seven adults, the tap is seven. We're going to focus on the Podesta brothers. We're going to focus on local pedophiles what what about the girl what about madeline it's like the victims get lost in these cases all too often yeah and i think it even happens with a case like john benet ramsey though i think the main difference between that one and 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 a lot of the other cases is is that there was a lot of footage so when they're making the documentary they can show footage of this girl alive, but I still think she gets lost in the case and lost in the investigation. And then it, it becomes, you know, people in, in the Madeline case, Kate and Jerry, they're the devil and they want to, they want to crucify them. And I don't know. And, and then, and I think every, everything else and everybody else becomes, the focus and it, and we forget that here's this three-year-old girl that lost her life. We could presume that she lost her life. And I, and I think it happens too, like with, you know, missing person cases as well. I mean, like we talked about the Mara Murray case. I mean, we have a family um, that has been looking, you know, uh, take the Mara Murray case. Here's one of the most fascinating things. I remember listening. Well, I, I don't want to give the source away, but <laughs> There's all these reports, and there was an individual reporting that the family knew that Mara went missing, and they were in on it, right? That was the report. That was the speculation. The family was in on it. And I talked to this guy that worked with Fred and searched for Mara and was up there every weekend for years. And then he told me how eventually, yeah, well, Fred Fred would go up there every weekend he could. Eventually, he couldn't go up there every weekend. A couple of years later, now now he's going up pretty much every other weekend. And years later, I talked to people that know the family, and Fred's still up there. And he's up there so much that there's some like famous like uh, Google Maps, where if you're like looking up like that area to like see the lay of the land or how she wrecked her car, you can see Fred in one of those pictures that were take, taken by, you know, and he's there searching for his daughter. And so, you know, families get thrown under, under the bus when, when armchair detectives and authors and writers are trying to find a missing person. So, and I, I think we, we forget the victims a lot of times. Yeah, I think in a lot of these cases, the victim is definitely the last thing that people think about when it comes to, you know, the media coverage. And it's it's sad and it's important for shows like your show and for my show and for other podcasters 
or even authors to understand that, you know, there are re real people involved in these cases and that, you know, providing it, I don't know, I want to say providing a service, but providing a platform for any bit of extra advocacy or attention that we could provide to a case, I think is invaluable. And yeah, yeah. And, but there's also repercussions, um, for your accusations. And again, I, I won't, I can't talk too much about it because I don't want to uh, offend a family, but a case that I've been looking into, uh, there was some speculation, some possible speculation that the person disappeared on their own and wanted to live a different life with a different like alternative lifestyle. And it was important information. And I, I actually talked about it. And I, got, I actually had the family reach out to me to say, you should shut up. You're, you're talking about something you know nothing about. And they, and then the email, they said, if you do not hear it from the family or that you do not hear it from police officers or detectives, that it's, you know, it, it shouldn't be put out there through the media. Now, what they didn't know was my source was a detective that told me the speculation. And I pointed out that it was speculation, but they have to follow these rabbit holes when they're investigating these cases and they followed the rabbit hole as far as they could get to and all they could get to is it's a possibility so but but we do have to be we have to hold ourselves accountable when we're making accusations or we're putting out some of the theories you know and and it's okay to have these discussions because i do think I know law enforcement follows a lot of these cases. I know law enforcement checks out a lot of these podcasts. And it's just like there's so many detectives that will go and take a case to a psychic. And they don't believe in psychics. Well, why do they want to go to a, a psychic? Because they might get a different perspective. You know, we have a missing person case, ongoing missing person case here. I contacted the police. We're, we're interviewing his wife. They said, well, that's great. When you're done with it, send me the audio files. I'll, we've already interviewed her multiple times. She's being cooperative with us, but maybe she'll say something different or say, you know, say something in a different manner or say different information that will lead us in the right direction. Yeah, I'm definitely. Uh, I, you got me heated up. I though. did. I got you fired up, man. All these damn rabbit holes, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the things that keeps this whole machine running to be honest with you is is the desire to get answers and the desire to find closure for families and you know just kind of close the mysteries of some of our childhoods or just mysteries well, of and i think some of the the interesting part too about these cases is they're like a puzzle and but they're a very big puzzle and i think that's why there's a lot of cases like west memphis three john benet ramsey you know madeline mccann that there's so much information, like I said, you have to dissect it piece by piece by piece. Um, and I've talked to some very, I mean, and you know this, like with the Amy, the Amy Mahalovic case, I mean, there's a, it's a case with a lot of information, a lot of suspects, and a lot to dissect. And it it will take you, I mean, for for me to know as much as you do, or James Renner, or, or as much as Nick does about the Amy Mahalovic case, I would have to study this for years. So uh, I think these passion cases, for whatever reason, they just they grab you and you, and you just can't. It's this puzzle that you your brain is convinced that you can figure out. I feel like every time I, I Google Madeline or, or Google, Google uh John Monet Ramsey, I feel like there's a part of me that's just like, if I just can look at it a little bit longer, I can solve it. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way. That's why websites like Web Sleuth and, you know, all these different Doe projects and different yeah. projects out there, you know, they do exist for a reason, and that is to hopefully find closure or at least an answer because closure is a four-letter word in a lot of these cases. There's no such thing. 
for right. any family that loses a family member, in my opinion. And, so. and my my lasting thought on the Madeline case is I, I don't know why this known pedophile makes contact with the family. I don't know if I buy some of these sniffing dogs accounts. I don't know if I buy the way the family acted when the police showed up because people said that was strange. Yeah, we didn't even get into the dogs and the sense that they picked up. But and yeah, but once they explore it, they can definitely look up that aspect yeah. of the case. And I think there's, like I said, there's so m- much to this case. Um, but like I said, I think logically you have a place that's being broken into. You have a place that is, there's also a lot of sex trafficking, child trafficking in this area. And you have a family that made a, a huge mistake by being about 150 yards away and they couldn't protect their kid. And I think that's, that's something that it's surprising that both of them are still alive because I think it would have destroyed most people. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good final <laughs> thought. One, one of, I want to hear like in your shortest way possible, do you have any particular suspect that you think this person could be? Or do you think that it's well, still no, such I, a rabbit hole? Well, I think it's such a big rabbit hole, but my gut feeling is, my gut feeling really is that, uh, okay, so my gut feeling is even though I took you down this really exciting rabbit hole with Clement Freud, mm-hmm. and he's connected to Robert Morat, and he was, and Morat was one of the first suspects, and they are connected somehow to the Podesto brothers, which are connected to the Clintons and connected to this giant sex trafficking ring with higher ups and and the world domination and the new world order and the Illuminati. As I think about all that, I also think one of the reasons, like I said, if we have multiple break-ins that we have no suspects for, I don't think the Podesto brothers are breaking into a place. No. Still Walkmans and what have you. I think it's probably more likely that they broke into places before. I don't know if, I don't even know if the person that broke in had the intention of stealing a child. I'm just saying that the people that break in and take stuff, they also find ways and have find channels to get rid of that stuff. Is it possible? that somebody broke into the place and there was nothing of value other than this child. And they took this child and left again. Then people go, well, why did they take the the girl and and not the twins? How many kids can you carry? That's that. Yeah. No, for one. And if it was just one person and I think this person again, is probably just a, a simple thief. And that's probably why it will never be solved. The simple thief sold her, to a sick organization and that's probably what why it's not solved i also think again it's possibly not solved because how much information and misinformation there is i think that's definitely one of the things that prevents some of these cases from getting solved is you have all these different people all these cooks in the kitchen and don't necessarily have the best communication between the portuguese police the scotland yard i mean things are going to get lost in the sauce. It's just, that's just the way it goes. And that's not to say anybody's at fault for it. It's just. Well, and the other thing that becomes tricky about this is motivation. Portugal doesn't have the greatest economy. One of their best things that they have is people coming there for cheap vacations. And you do not, if you can blame the parent for her death, then it has nothing to do with traveling there. So motivation becomes something very important to look at in these cases. Yeah, I I agree a hundred percent. And I mean, I have my own thoughts on who it may be or I I don't have like a specific person, but you you know, I have a gut feeling that what your theory is, is kind of what it is. Um, Occam's razor philosophy meaning you know the easiest answer is usually the answer uh the fact that there were break-ins occurring at the hotel resort whatever weeks prior and the fact that 
they said at first that these windows weren't you weren't able to get into them but they proved that you were i think most likely what happened is what you said but i also do believe there may have been a pre you know it was pre-planned that they were going in to get this girl because they had been at this resort for you know they were getting ready to leave i think in two days or a day and so people would have seen her yeah and so there would have been an opportunity for them to say oh who's that and let's follow them to where they're staying and then now you know where they're staying and oh look the parents just left for dinner i think it yeah that situation is it seems like the most likely in my in my two cents well again i don't think it's that far fetched to have somebody that that worked at the restaurant go well i know so and so and he steals kids and these parents keep coming here yep. and their kids are all alone and for this little 3 year old blonde you know little pretty blonde girl we can get thousands and thousands of dollars and i again i don't know all the inner workings uh, of of rings like that but i know they exist and and that becomes very scary that's why you can't take chances uh, to leave your kids that far away when when you're in a foreign country. Yeah, and I, even if you're, I mean, even if you're at home, I mean, you just got to be more proactive as far as what type of criminals are out there. And we definitely know that these issues exist. And I mean, if you just want to look up, a, you know, make yourself sick to your stomach, look up your local sex offender list and see how many people live in the areas that you also live or ne live near and i just think that uh is a big problem that doesn't really get talked about enough so i'm hoping that one day there'll be some resolution but i also understand that with the situations at hand that the likelihood of them actually getting a solid concrete answer at this point I mean, all you can do is hold out hope, but it's not looking good. Yeah, I'd say that the chances of them having any evidence that she was alive, I mean, the the best chance of this being solved is if somehow she's still alive. And I just don't think, I just don't think that's the likelihood. And if she is, I really, I don't even want to imagine what hell she's been through and yeah i mean that just that thought is terrifying alone i mean if she is still alive just imagine what could be happening because she would be 15 now right yeah because she's been missing for 12 yeah. years five months and 11 days crazy thanks again for joining me this week captain you are definitely one of the uh, leaders in the clubhouse in the true crime department and your show continues to produce incredible episodes and I can't thank you enough for taking this amount of time out of your day to uh, discuss the Madeline McCann case. And so thank well, you thanks. for being on the Passion Case. Thank you, Bill, for having me. I've been a fan of all your work on the Amy Mahalovic case, and, and I applaud your effort. Well, thank you very much. And again, that's a case that we all hope will find resolution as well. So thank you very much. And thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of My Passion Case. And thank you to the captain for joining me this week to discuss the infamous disappearance of Miss Madeline McCann. I will be dropping new episodes every Monday of my passion case, and I will continue to drop new episodes of Who Killed as well on Fridays. If you do enjoy my podcast, you can help support the show by clicking on the donate button on the right-hand side of slowburnmedia.com. That is slow minus the W. Or you can always donate via the Venmo app with my username at bill-huffman-3. I will also provide a link in the show notes. Any amount is appreciated, and it does help keep this podcast running. For the second year in a row, I will be representing Who Killed, My Passion Case, and Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic on Podcast Row at CrimeCon 2020 in Orlando. Please use my promo code AMY2020 to save 10% off your ticket price. And if you've never been, 
it's really a must for all true crime fans. And if you guys want to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that would be great. That will help keep the show in the spotlight. And again, I will be dropping new episodes every Mondays and Fridays. So if you'd like to stay up to date on the cases that I'm working on or the cases that I've covered in the past, as well as the new shows that I have in the pipeline, please follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. And thank you again so much for listening. And until next time, be safe.